Hey there, fellow Sojourners. Welcome back to Appropriating the Culture, which is the single greatest and only program on the entire web that analyzes the culture from a Christian perspective and prescribes, God permitting, the practical prescriptions to counter the prevailing winds of decadency and moral decay. At least that's the goal. There's always the chance that God has utterly forsaken us, at which point this is nothing but incriminating evidence to be used at my show trial. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your future cellmate for trying to appropriate the culture. So last week I ruffled a few feathers by making the audacious claim that Christian art, particularly Christian filmmaking, is subpar. But wait a second, isn't art subjective? Isn't it a matter of taste? Some people like the sound of jazz, some like the sound of rock, some like the sound of the smoke detector. Heck, sometimes I'll intentionally set fires just to hear my favorite jam. And if it's too loud, that's just because you're too old. Now wait a minute. Are you actually comparing Christian films to a smoke detector? That's not even art. You said it, not me. The thing is, at some point, there is a minimal threshold for what constitutes music, and there can be, and often is, a broad consensus on the quality of art that crosses a threshold that is beyond mere taste. Now, if only there were a way of assessing the broad consensus of the quality of Christian films, like a collection of different people's thoughts and all collated with like an aggregate or something. Alas, no such thing exists. For the sight impaired or those listening via podcast, I was putting up an assortment of prominent Christian films with their Rotten Tomato scores and being a snarky jerk about it. Because that's not really fair, right? Movie critics just hate Christians, true, but they could also just hate your movie. It's possible that your fourth grade teacher hated your guts and that's why she gave you such poor marks on your math test. Or maybe she didn't hate you at all, and you're just bad at math. Or maybe she did hate you, and you're also just bad at math. All valid options, but which one is it when it comes to the critics? I think there is unquestionably hostility towards Christians in the film review world, but not every Christian film is rotten. Some are sitting pretty at 60%. Once again, for those of you who are sight impaired or listening on the podcast, I shamelessly put up the Rotten Tomato score of a movie that I made, which none of you have seen, and frankly, nor should you. Here's actually a better example. The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, certified fresh. Ooh, la-di-da. Now, it's not a Christian film in the sense that it was made by Christians, but it's absolutely a Christian film in its message and theme and the fact that it's literally an allegory for Jesus. And the success of the writings of people like Lewis or Tolkien is proof that the Christian worldview and Christian themes and Christian ideas and Christian messages will resonate with even godless, horrible, deplorable, irredeemable film critics if it's done through competent and compelling storytelling. So often I think Christians feel obligated to support and like Christian films, not because of the artistic merit, but because they like the message. It's basically our version of Piss Christ. Which, if you're unfamiliar, Piss Christ is exactly what it sounds like. An artwork that was a plastic crucifix photographed in a glass tank of the artist's own urine. Which I guess is better than using someone else's urine. Or maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm not an artist. At any rate, it worked out well as that artwork was a winner at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Arts and sold for $277,000. Why? Because of its clear artistic merit? It's beauty, it's artistic skill, it's profound complexity. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's because people like the message, or at least the perceived message. But Christians, I think, also will support and champion and turn over their hard-earned cash, not because of the artistic merit, beauty, or skill of Christian films, but because they like the message. And that's okay. You, you can watch whatever you want to watch and like what you like. But this is about appropriating the culture. And what we have to understand is that non-believers look at our films the same way we look at Piss Christ. Oh, it's about the message, not the art. Because the art is just excrement. And that's usually and understandably met with revulsion and a terrible Rotten tomato score. Well, you may say we don't make our films for the critics. Fair enough, but um, who do we make them for? That's a good question that leads us to one of the biggest problems that afflicts Christian filmmaking, a confused purpose and a wrong audience, which we'll dive into after a word from our sponsor. 
Appropriating the Culture is brought to you by MAMGA, the Modern Art, Modern Guide app, the essential companion piece for exploring modern art. MAMGA offers the most extensive and up-to-date registry of modern art and works seamlessly with any smartphone camera. Just take a picture of any art exhibit and MAMGA's unique software does the rest, instantaneously alerting you if it's a piece of modern art or not. Don't waste your museum tour staring at a trash can that's just a trash can and not a piece of modern art. Download the app onto any smartphone today to give you the confidence to know that what you're looking at is art and not just a clogged toilet. MAMGA, curate with confidence. Alrighty, so where were we? Oh yeah, confused purpose and wrong audience. When the Apostle Paul taught in the synagogues, he spoke and argued on behalf of the gospel using the Old Testament. He used their scriptures. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. But when he was in Athens speaking to Gentiles at the Areopagus, 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 let's go with that one. Uh, he didn't speak to them from the Old Testament. No, instead, he uses the words of the Gentile poets. Here's the scene. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, Paul is arguing a biblical worldview in every instance, but he changes his tactics based on the audience. He quotes the scriptures when it comes to the Jews, but not when it comes to the Gentiles in Athens. Why? Because the Old Testament meant nothing to that Gentile audience. So instead, he argued in favor of the Christian worldview using the words of their Gentile poets. Sidebar. The only reason that Paul could quote their poets was because he read them. He was able to use that cultural touchstone because he was familiar with it. You know, so often I think Christians take pride in their cultural ignorance. Who's that? Never heard of them. What's that? Never seen it. I don't even own a television. What's a television? See, we like that because we feel like it sets us apart. And we are called to be set apart. That's what holiness is. But holiness is about being set apart in righteousness, not obliviousness. Now, that's not to say that you must be engaged and up to date on all the aspects of the culture. Definitely not. But let's not confuse obliviousness with holiness. There is an important principle at play here that we see with Paul, and it's something that we need to learn in order to best utilize the arts for evangelism. Number one, recognize the audience, and number two, speak their language. Paul approached a Jewish audience differently than he approached a Gentile audience. He tailored his message to best fit the particular audience that he was addressing. Here's an argument from Anecdote. Once in Japan, an American pastor was speaking to a Japanese audience through an interpreter. He said, when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and then he paused to let the translator translate. And the interpreter translates and, and keeps going on and, and on and, and on and on. And the American pastor started to get annoyed. He goes, hey, what's going on here? You are clearly not saying what I'm saying. The interpreter replied, um, these people don't know who Moses is. They don't know who the Israelites are. They have no idea why they were in Egypt, and they have no idea why they're leaving. So I'm explaining it. 
See, interpreting is about more than just translating words, and speaking someone's language is about more than just a shared or common tongue. It's about worldview and background and recognizing and understanding the audience. Part of the problem, particularly with Christian movies, is that they fail to recognize their audience or speak their language. They are often confused in purpose and marketed and directed to the wrong audience. Meaning, most Christian films are meant to evangelize. Their purpose is to be evangelical, to reach non-believers. And yet, all of the marketing language, and sensibilities of the films are usually geared for a Christian audience. That is a confusion of purpose that is trying to make a film directed at non-believers by appealing to believers. That is a failure to recognize the audience and speak someone else's language. Of course, there's nothing wrong about Christian films being made for Christian audiences. In fact, that would be a welcome addition to have content that is actually spiritually mature and deep that is meant for Christians in order to strengthen and enrich the body of Christ. But what we typically end up with is the worst of all worlds, evangelical films meant for non-believers that are often too shallow and infantile for the spiritually mature, but geared and directed with Christian sensibilities that appeals to only Christians. If Christian film is to be evangelical in any meaningful sense, it must be made and marketed to the sensibilities of the non-believer, not the believer. It must speak their language, not our language. This is particularly important because so often we sanitize our portrayal of the world in film to satisfy the sensitivities of Christian audiences. For friggity's sake, I've seen Christian films portray gang members with cleaner mouths than I have. See, we know that uh, gang members don't sound like that or talk like that in reality, but naughty words or bad words are offensive to Christian audiences. So we deliberately misrepresent the world as it is in order to make it family friendly. But not every story is family friendly. A quick read through the Bible will demonstrate that. And although there can be compelling reasons to sanitize, it's not without ramification, as misrepresentation is a sort of falsehood. Why should non-believers think that we have the truth when we get the little thing so wrong? If our portrayal of the world does not correspond to reality, uh, then why should anyone believe us? If we are going to be making films for non-believers, they should not be fixed primarily on the sensitivities and sensibilities of Christians. That's a confusion of purpose and audience. We'll get more into this next week, but feel free to air out your grievances on my author Facebook page or the other major socials. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review, and I'll see you back here again next week to appropriate some culture.